Welcome everyone to another episode of Architect Tomorrow. I'm really pleased that we've got another a nice group together here to talk about another uh, another book. And um, so it's also brilliant, Wendy, for you to be back talking about books because you featured not that long ago talking about um, strategy to reality, uh, which was great. And so we'll draw on some some of that, I'm sure. And also, um, David, welcome to the Architect Tomorrow podcast series. Um, yeah, thank you. And, uh, and and Eric, thank you for agreeing. I always love it when authors uh, agree to come on. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Talk about you know why you uh, chose to write it and sort of what inspired you and who the kind of the target audience is and various things like that. And uh, the fact that obviously Wendy's written the foreword as well. It's, it's sort of interesting angles and for. Um, for those listening, I've asked David also just to join because uh, I've actually, David and I have been talking about enterprise architecture. What is this thing, enterprise architecture? And David's been quite curious about potentially that being a, a perhaps a future career uh, pathway. So I thought, given the, the book, and I'm about to give the game away about what the book is that we're about to sort of unbox and, and do, but, but David David offers a, a cool angle on, on, on this topic as well. Um, but, but, but yeah, before we get into all of that, Eric, can you... Um, Perhaps just give us a bit of intro to yourself. Um, what's your What's your background before I go and find the package that we're going to unbox in a minute? Sure. Well, first of all, uh, thanks for having me. It's all, uh, of course a pleasure to be here. So I am an architect by profession, enterprise architect to be more precise. I think I've been doing this for about 15 to 18 years or so. So it was a in my book of a long time ago that I made the shift from IT where I, I started my career as a, as a systems engineer uh, to architecture. And over the years, I've tried to improve my skills in the field of architecture, among other things, by attending training courses like the TOGAF and Archimate uh, courses. Also, most recently, the Certified Business Architect certification course by the Business Architecture Guild. And I also hold a, a master architect certification in the field of enterprise architecture. Now, having done the certified business architect training course, this was what really spiked my interest in the strategic part of enterprise architecture. And I always was busy with that part of the profession, but the knowing the, the uh, facts about business architecture, the, the angle about it gave it way more guidance and, and, and tools. So that's part of the, the profession uh, about me. Now, in my day job, I'm an uh, architecture consultant, uh, also a lecturer on enterprise architecture at the Eindhoven University of Technology. And in my spare time, I like to write about the profession in the form of blogs, just things or, or situations or some challenges that I encounter in daily life with regard, of course, to enterprise architecture. Cool, and that leads on really nicely to me reaching behind here and like, uh, and, and yeah, I, I wonder what this is. Uh, I've, I've kind of caught, killed the surprise already, right? But let's just do the classic stupid uh, unboxing. So let's go on the packaging, let's go on that. And, uh, and what do we have in here? Yeah, okay. So unsurprisingly, we have Eric's recent book, <laughs> Getting Started with Enterprise Architecture. And you can see I have a few little stickies and things in here for the kind of key, key bits that I, I mean, it's a great book, but there's some key sort of visuals and things that we'll, that we'll talk about. Um, but um, I guess before we get into some of the, you know, the details of the book, um, what let's kick off with what inspired you to actually write uh, this book in the first place. Let's start there, Eric, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure, of course. Well, like I said, I've, I have some years of experience in the in architecture. I've been doing this for, for 15 years. And in my time, I've seen a lot of organizations trying to implement or wanting to implement uh, architecture, but they always try to uh, do it at full scale, you know, the full breadth of, of all with all the bells and whistles there are. Um, and what you've, what I've noticed during the, those implementations, often that the uh, solid foundation is actually missing from it. They try to to do uh, too much almost. So when I noticed that, I thought, well, maybe that could be a nice topic for an upcoming blog or something. So I started to, to write down some ideas and I actually kept on writing because of all the situations I encountered with various employers. And my wife actually um, made a joke about, well, it looks like you're writing some, some sort of book instead of a, a blog. And then I thought, well, maybe you're actually right. So I, I kept on writing, writing and the, the book uh, took shape. So eventually 
something that started out as just a blog turned out into a, a book. Brilliant. And so, so Wendy, I guess when we were um, preparing for this, uh, we talked a little bit about the parallels between your book and Eric's book. And it's great that you wrote the, a lovely foreword for the book. But is it is it just the, the foreword? What perhaps the pair of you can talk a bit about the alignment, or is it just is it just for is it just coincidence that there's so much alignment, or were the two of you comparing notes? To help us understand, Wendy, like your involvement in this. Good, good, good question. I mean, I think there there is alignment inevitably, as you've already heard here, and, and I would say along a couple lines in particular. Um, one is just practicality, right? So not just, you know, what do we do? Eric, you said, you know, sometimes organizations do too much or we really focus on knowledge base, but it's the practicality, it's the usage, it's the value. So that's one area of alignment. Um, and the second is, um, Eric, as you were talking about getting the CBA, right? I think your interest in business architecture and bringing that solid perspective and the positioning between strategy and execution makes for, uh, I think, a, a wonderful complement and what uh, inspired me to get involved as well. I mean, that's one of the big things I, I, I love about the book is too often EA books are incredibly theoretical or perhaps, don't get me wrong, and Wendy, uh, you know how much I love business architecture, but maybe go too far on that. Extra. If it's an enterprise architecture book, you need to kind of cover, you do need to cover technology and that um, classic straddling role or that bridging role that the enterprise architecture functional role can 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 fulfill uh, and I guess that that's what I really love about it is that you manage to cover both and you don't get lost in the IT side which some books do because that's perhaps where the author has come from they've come from IT and they've not been able to lift themselves up a level but 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 also um the the things like the implementation wheel that's like a, like a pivotal to, to to the book in, in in my eyes is a really nice way of kind of looking at the various frameworks and other approaches that are out there but um, you know, getting that broad view on the topic, I suppose. And um, David, I guess I'm going to come to, to to you now and kind of get as a as a as a newbie, I suppose, to this sort of space. What was your, I guess, what's your sort of take on on, on the book and things like the wheel and the ways of kind of getting getting going on this topic? Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, um, I had very really very little understanding of arch uh, enterprise architecture and other than conversations I had with you, Ollie. Um, and I had obviously my own sort of preconceptions of what it meant and what it was um, very much kind of aligned more towards the heavy IT end. And when I think of enterprise, I think of enterprise-sized businesses. So I was thinking enterprise-sized IT infrastructures, um, which, you know, totally over my head and no idea. Um, <clears throat> so this book was really quite, quite enlightening um, to really kind of actually see it from a completely different angle and realizing actually... I was completely wrong. <laughs> actually, it's completely different to what I expected. Um, and actually, yeah, I found it actually very easy to read, considering I, I expect it to be a complex technical subject. And in fact, um, obviously there's a lot of content, but um, actually very easy to read, very approachable. Um, and yeah, just it just flipped uh, my misconceptions of what it was into something completely different, completely shaped it differently. And Eric, I guess on those misconceptions, it was that sort of one of the drivers behind the book was to sort of write something that tries to introduce people to this area in the right way. I mean, like you talked about your years of experience, but yeah, kind of is is, is that what was that one of the kind of drivers to move this from just a blog to a book? Yeah, absolutely. Because that was a was it still is actually a struggle that I see is happening in, in, in the world of architecture within the community. I mean, and there's been a lot of fighting that we actually do uh, within the community to get people around us, around us as architects to understand that enterprise architecture is not just a, a technical instrument. It is a strategic business management tool. So there are a lot of ways that you can use enterprise architecture uh, in relation to your business goals and, and objectives and realizing that um, a strategy, of, um, making sure that you actually get to realize the vision you have as an organization and not just be confined to the outlines of IT. Um, so that is something that I really wanted to stress in, in the book and, and therefore tried to shine a light on all the architecture domains that are 
part of enterprise architecture, not just focus on the technical side of it, um, but also give as much as attention as possible to the, the non-technical domains. So yeah, that's, that's something I absolutely tried. And according to what I just heard from David, I kind of succeeded in doing so. That's So that's nice to hear. The, the other thing I think it's fair to say you succeeded on doing is uh, uh, helping people navigate TOGAF, right? I mean, TOGAF is, it's a bit of a Marmite topic, I think, with enterprise architects, right? I mean, I uh, I think there are there's a lot of value in it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not. I, I don't want everyone to start flaming me in the comments about about Togaf, but um, but let's face it. We and we talked a little about that in the in the prep for this. That there is a little bit of a dogmatic, or there has been in the past, a bit of a dogmatic approach to sort of applying Togaf and taking things like the architecture development method, you know, the ADM, literally. Uh, and, and so yeah, that's what I really liked about what you've done, you've kind of brought in play various sort of frameworks, but introduced them in a way where it's, you use them in, in, in a common sense way. And I, 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 I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, you know, the, the kind of getting started, because that was a really interesting conversation we were having the other day about the, one of the challenges with ADM is it almost assumes that you are, you've been dropped in to actually start looking at something specific. So yeah, before, before I take any more words out of your mouth, Perhaps you you beautifully talk about the way perhaps in reality you get started with EA. Now, what you see if, if, if you look at the the TOGAF ADM uh, in the, in this case is that it assumes that you're starting from the point of view of of a project or a specific task that you want to to implement or that you need to implement, and the the ADM starts with the preliminary phase and the architecture vision phase, which among other things. Uh, talks about defining goals and objectives for the organization or for the, the project you're doing. But when you start with the implementation of enterprise architecture within an organization, an organization that is actually new to working with architecture, then it's not something you do on your first day. You do not get to sit at the board table discussing all those goals and objectives and, and, and whatnot. What you need to do is actually get a, a feeling of the organization, what the organization is about in terms of the organizational uh, model, the, the hierarchy within uh, the organization, the processes it, used, uh, it uses, the, the information that goes around within the organization. And so it's kind of like an, an inventory phase that you go through before yeah. you can relate all the gathered information back to the goals and objectives of the organization. So the reverse engineering or, or bottom-up approach of aligning what the company is about and, and how it does what it does back to the uh, goals is comes later on in the, the architectural cycle, so to speak. So that's a major change of what I try to visualize using the enterprise architecture implementation wheel when you compare it to the TOGAF ADM. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, and I, I, as I say, I think that's a much cleaner way of kind of looking at the reality, the pragmatic reality of implementing EA. And Wendy, I guess there's got to be parallels there to the stuff you've been doing around sort of strategy to execution, right? In terms of, it's quite rare that you'll bring in something as broad an instrument as strategic sort of planning or business architecture or enterprise architecture, and just get to look at a very I mean, it may, maybe maybe there is a specific burning problem which you get thrown in at, but I guess yeah. How does that align with your sort of experiences? Yeah, no, this this really resonates. Even Eric, what you're saying, starting with what's that inventory? What's the view of an organization from the business architecture baseline perspective? Capabilities, value streams, information concepts, but key is getting just enough just in time so that we can use it for something. As Eric and, and, and you both mentioned, right, we're not always at the tables we want to be strategically, but if we have that view ready to go and we build out the knowledge base, right, sort of as we need it, brick by brick, um, we can be ready for the conversations, we can be ready for the usage scenarios. And, and why I think this is also really important from my perspective, um, you know, Eric, you mentioned, you know, sort of starting with the lens of projects, we are way upstream with business architecture. We are shaping the work. We're not thinking about a project, right? We can't make nearly as much impact. So this gives us, you know, the ability to affect change much further upstream anyway. And that touches really nicely on the next 
topic I was going to move us on to, which is sort of architectural principles, which, again, another section of the book I really, really liked. Um, because, and there's this classic one in there about cloud first. I feel like every organization I've worked in as an architect has had the cloud re recently, obviously since the advent of the cloud, has had like cloud first as a principle. And I liked how you sort of picked that apart. Could you maybe sort of, yeah, talk talk, talk a bit about, about sort of that sort of misnomer, I suppose, when it comes to architectural principles? Because I think it touches on what Wendy's saying, it's like that upfront sort of shaping and getting us in the right place kind of perspective. Yeah, if you, I think if you look at, at the principles and requirements and, and or guidelines and standards and, and stuff like that, there's a lot of confusion about that that actual definition or, or what the, what they mean and what you should understand about it. So um, I think in general, it's safe to say that there is misunderstanding about principles. In, in my book, literally and figuratively speaking, um, principles should be like the constitution. So they're very much high level. They don't change all that often. And requirements are a little more detailed um, compared to principles and standards, of course, uh, define an actual product or service or, or, or whatever. Um, so if you look at the uh, example we just gave, like cloud first, or an, another good one is reuse before buy, before build. It's also a principle that, or principle that comes along very often. And those are actually IT guidelines, I'd like to call them, because they, they actually detail the principle that lays on top of it. What I mean by that, and I give a few examples in my book as well, is that if you um, look at the principle that lays on top of that, it, it's even broader or more general in, in scope. So you, when you look at the, the cloud first principle, you could actually say that, I mean, the cloud um, first requirement, I should say, then there is a principle that lays on top of that, um, guiding the organization to use standard products and services. So that would be the, the uh, actual principle. If you further define using standard products and services, you get to using cloud first because, for example, you have third party uh, uh, contracts with third party suppliers that demand uh, certain services that you um, use from them. If you detail it even further, you get to the, the, the lower part of the, the uh, framework pyramid that I use in my book, and you get to the level of standards. And on the standards level, you could uh, detail the use of cloud services to a specific provider, given the contract that you have with the organization. So that's actually how the, the framework period came to, came to be. If you look at the... Uh, the shape of the pyramid, there is a, a very small top, of course, and a, a larger bottom. Um, so looking from, from top to bottom, you could say it goes from general to very specific, where the principles are at the top being very general, um, in, in um, being very general. The requirements is, is in the middle and standards at the bottom. And the shape of the pyramid kind of resembles the number of principles, requirements, and standards that you should have in your organization. So you cannot have more principles than you have standards. So that shapes the the pyramid. Mm. Hope I made myself kind of clear. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I think I guess there's a there's a danger, isn't there, that that, that, it, that in architecture we perhaps try and plan out too much, whereas this sort of focusing on some kind of key guiding principles and then defining out sort of standards where where we want to kind of go into the detail um yeah so it's 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 certainly something i've seen time and time again and i must confess i think i'm responsible for quite a few buy uh, over re, you know, re reuse over buy over build type principles so um yeah i'm kind of giving myself an internal ticking off for some of that but anyway um <laughs> so this leads me on to sort of talking about the, the the core of the book which i think that david and i were talking about this like chapter eight is is almost a book in itself but it's but it's brilliant because it's got so much depth and, and and detail in it and i guess david what what was your sort of reflections around because i know you're a very visual person as well and i think one of the things perhaps was surprising for you is quite how visual sort of elements of enterprise architecture are what was your sort of takeaway from chapter eight because there's a lot in there isn't there yeah um yeah, after getting through the first few chapters then I don't know why I sort of looked at how much left there was in the book. And I saw chapter eight was like a hundred pages long. And I thought, oh, wow, this is, this is going to be a big one. 
<laughs> um, I mean, it makes sense. Um, the, the context of what it actually covers, um, you know, it really kind of covers the deliverables and what's actually included and all the steps to achieving it. I mean, obviously it goes around the wheel. Um, but yeah, as you said, I'm, I'm kind of a visual person. I, I do a lot of diagramming and designing myself. So seeing seeing how each piece breaks down basically into multiple different types of diagram and how you kind of explain and structure these things. Um, and not just, you know, it's just not just a, a handful of diagrams and the techniques and tools. It's, you know, there's dozens of them, um, which made it easier for me to understand, but also, um, you know, I can relate to it easier. I can understand uh, how to use it myself. I can see the purpose of it. I can see, you know, the point of it. Um, but importantly as well, how you use those tools in order to communicate to stakeholders and other people in the business. It, um, it just made a lot of sense of, you know, a lot of the complexity and the, the you know, the things that are involved in, in enterprise architecture, but breaking it down into just ultimately simple diagrams um, just makes it very you know, digestible. So I remember you asking me the question of, so, but Oliver, what, what does an enterprise architect yeah. actually do, do in terms of deliverables? So I yeah. think chapter eight beautifully sort of summarized that. And so I guess, Eric, is that, I guess, yeah, you do, you do the lecturing, you know, you, you do a lot of these sort of conversations around what architecture involves. So is this the sort of collective wisdom, I suppose, that you've kind of passed down to your sort of students on, on, on some of this topic? Is, is that why chapter eight was sort of quite large? Yeah, well, actually, it, it, it kind of is. Uh, well, if we if we go back to to the main reason for wanting to write the book or or uh, the message um, that I wanted to convey with the book is how do you actually get started with with this this profession this enterprise architecture and I think by providing um, all these these visuals these diagrams matrices and and whatnot it I my hope was to provide some tools for starting or or novice architects um, to to get on that journey, to actually take some steps in, in the right direction and not be overwhelmed by all the, uh, the theory that is available and where you're left to interpret it on your own. So I wanted to provide very practical or pragmatic uh, visuals that you could use instantly right from the start. So that is kind of like the subtitle for the book and practical pragmatic approach to learning the basics so that's what i try to uphold with the with the book so yeah that was absolutely the main goal and even so it still is just the basics because yeah. there is a lot more that could be visualized there are a lot more uh, diagrams or matrices and, and whatnot that could be perhaps in in a second or, or whatever book yeah um but this will will actually help you get started with uh, or allow you to um, get into the discussion with your with your stakeholders and uh, relate it back to certain goals and objectives of the organization so it, it helps to to paint a picture of what your organization is about what it does what it does not do etc yeah and I, and I like the fact that I guess you're introducing this sort of canvas or the kind of Tool, tool book sorry uh the the, the 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 toolbox as it were of, of different things you can use but then the where the experience i guess comes in and perhaps wendy there's there's an angle for you here is is when you use those different pictures deliverables and approaches because i think one of the things i learned the hard way was there are deliverables that create a great discussion internally in an architecture function right uh, that allow you to perhaps align and agree because I, I guess gone are the days where you have a single enterprise architect in an organization that, that, that those days are pretty much gone unless you're a very relatively small organization so there are there's an importance in inlining and your metal model and all that sort of good stuff but there's a danger you get stuck there and there's a little bit of navel gazing danger you know kind of going on there but like the art here Wendy for me is surely like knowing which one of these things is the thing to use when conveying a particular message or trying to get a particular outcome with stakeholders right I couldn't agree more, right? Um, yeah, yeah, most certainly. And I, I spend a lot of my days socializing business and enterprise architecture in a comprehensive you know, perspective from strategy to execution. And this balance right here is everything, right? If we just show people and show business stakeholders just the base models, it often doesn't resonate very much, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's not exactly how we view the business. That's nice. What do I do with it? So 
orienting around this why and knowing what to show people at what level of detail and also by the way what to build at what time right to get to those views that is the the art right there and honestly i think the key to success because as people see it and see insights on it that's when they buy in yeah i'm going to zoom to page so i've got like i said i've got a few chapter markers in here and i'm going to zoom to page 179 which to refresh your, your memory is the is the picture with with um strategy goal objective initiative and and change and i guess this is coming back to the sort of alignment between your your two books uh wendy and eric um this this was this is sort of quite magical for me the kind of seeing this i think in your book eric the kind of alignment with kind of the breakdown from how you kind of go from strategy to, to execution and change um so I, I guess some of this was perhaps just thinking along the same sort of lines but um yeah, I, I, I just think that if, if there are a couple of books that people want to read to get into the space, the kind of the, the one that Wendy, you've written and then, and then this one from an EA perspective, the, the two of them kind of go together re, uh, re, really nicely. And I guess that's, that's perhaps just happenstance that that's, that that's happened, but it's, but, it, but, but, it, but, it, but it's great. And I guess the question to you, Eric, is, yeah, I suppose, where do you, where do you sort of see um, you know, this kind of balance of, of, of EA and technology kind of creating sort of strain or challenge where do, where, so there's some organizations that get this that get this wrong aren't there so how do how do you sort of see this playing out um you know in, in the organizations you work with well like um i think you introduced at the very beginning of, of the podcast and enterprise architecture is still often seen as a, a technical instrument so it's, it's often viewed from from the it perspective meaning that organizations only allow enterprise architecture to be kind of a reactive profession and instead of a pro, um, proactive one. And I think that by aligning the business enterprise architecture part of enterprise architecture with the organizational goals, objectives, and requirements, and, and whatnot, you could actually you can, can actually create the value that an organization is often looking for, but not directly knows where they should look for it. And they certainly don't instantly think about the enterprise architect who is tucked away at the IT department mm. because they kind of uh, see the enterprise architect as, as part of IT. So it's not the, the get, uh, get to guy or get to girl um, in the, for organizations in the first place, which is actually kind of a, a pity because that is the person who should be answering uh, most of the, the the concerns or questions or, or whatnot that stakeholders have. They they can actually help an organization improve what they're doing by by realizing or by helping them realize their, their business goals and objectives. So I think that the business architecture part, the, the strategy part, or the strategy for, to execution part, is is a major part of enterprise architecture in its in its, uh, entirety yeah i guess this links to one of the questions i was going to ask you around securing executive buy-in do you think it's that alignment with strategy and sort of the broader um business objectives is that is that one of the kind of key key bits of advice for positioning ea to leadership or are there other ways that you would that you would position ea to leadership to get buy-in well, I've written a, a, a chapter about the positioning of enterprise architecture within an organization. I think it's 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 crucial to do it. Um, I would I wanted to say the right way, but there are uh, a lot of ways to do things right. Of sure. course, depending yeah. on what you <laughs> want to gain from using enterprise architecture. Yeah. <clears throat> um, personally, I think that. If there is no buy-in from senior management or the, the CIO or the, the board of directors within your organization, then you shouldn't want to practice enterprise architecture in the first place because it, it will not deliver on what you hope it uh, will deliver on. Right. Right? This one example um, to kind of underline what I just said, I was not that long ago working for an organization where the CIO role was placed or, or positioned with uh, a, a member of the board. So there was architectural sponsorship on the, the highest level within the organization, allowing uh, me as the, as the enterprise architect to, to 
practice enterprise architecture on the full breadth of what the profession is about. Well, as you probably know, the, these persons who are members of the board, they are for a certain period of time. So his, his period ended and the organization then decided to move the CIO role to the director of IT. Almost instantly confining the movement I uh, or the, the movability I had with, with my profession uh, to the confines of IT. So this, the scope of my work field was instantly reduced to a very small part to actually one single domain of, of the entirety of enterprise architecture, meaning that I, I couldn't do what I was supposed to actually be doing. So it, it is essential to know how an organization looks at enterprise architecture, or, or let's call it just simply architecture, what they want with the profession and in what way they want the profession to help them realize their, their goals and objectives. The actual positioning of architecture is, is very closely related to what the organization wants to achieve with, when they uh, hire the architect and when they want to practice architecture. So uh, a lot of organizations do not think about what they actually want to get to gain from enterprise architecture and they actually learn learn by doing or on the way yeah and then they instantly confine it to the IT department not always on purpose but it is something that is continuously happening yeah it's 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 a challenging relationship isn't it i think the the relationship that ea has with the technology function like clearly there needs to be good alignment but if you're shackled to that area, then that, that can be quite limiting, right? And the other interesting thing, I think that this book helps perhaps um, much like Wendy's book does uh, educate sort of executives around the potential value of, of this. It's not just, I think uh, perhaps a, a lot of people see uh, see technology architecture or, or, or it, it, you know, wider EA as uh, architecture, as you were saying, as something that's very much about an outcome, like a technical outcome or a particular project or solution architecture, right? That That often is, the perception is it's it's a get something over the line rather than this broader more strategic sort of alignment piece that's really really important particularly in a world where everything is being enabled by digital or you know um the importance of apis now the importance of your data and ai and various other, you know, all these all these sort of new facets to business they're no longer like the domain of of a bunch of technologists in a cupboard this is front and center for, for businesses, right? It's it's whether they'll they'll live live and live and thrive and survive over the next sort of decades. Um, and those that don't embrace this sort of mentality of how do we think about our architecture across the board are are, are going to struggle. And the ones that you know that perhaps can sign it to the IT department are almost certainly going to struggle more than those that see it as a strategic kind of capability. Cool. Well, I've got a couple more questions, but before I kind of get onto those, David. Um, Questions for, for, for from any questions from you for Eric? I mean, a big one for me. Uh, if if I were to go into enterprise architecture, how do I get there? You know, what are the the, the skills, soft skills, hard skills? Uh, I I need to kind of progress a career into into architecture. Are there other architectural roles I should look at first? I think I could, of course, mention the the most obvious ones that you need to have uh, some sort of organizational sensitivity. Uh, or be susceptible to to that at least. Um, of course, the analytical skills and conceptual skills, etc. But I think that one thing that is almost as important as what the ones I just mentioned is being able to listen to your stakeholders, not just hear what they say, but actually listen, hear the the thing that they're not telling you. That, that's the the main challenge. So stakeholders often tell you A when they actually mean B because they have some form, form of hidden agenda and they don't want to show the back of their tongues uh, directly. So you have to, to ask follow-up questions to actually get to uh, the, the bottom of, of things. And being able to really listen to them, that's something I don't think um, you can easily learn. It's something you have to, to learn by doing. Uh, other than the conceptual skills or analytical skills, that's something that you perhaps could learn from uh, going on a, a course or a training or, or whatever. But the listening part is, is a, in my book, an essential way, um, essential part of practicing in ar architecture in, in that sense. And how do you get to being an enterprise architect? If I look back at how my journey 
uh, went. It was not something that I, for instance, that I went from system engineering to project leader to business analyst to enterprise architect. It was just that I had a lot of experience by doing the same things over and over again, installing computer systems and, and, and creating networks and, and so forth, that I thought at one point at a time, well, I've been doing this a long time. Maybe it's it's time for me to take a step back, look at the situation from a more high level perspective. And when I was uh, doing that for over, let's say a year, and I looked back at what at the, the past period that I was doing that, I thought, well, maybe this has something to do with architectural work. So it's kind of a natural flow. It was kind of a natural flow for me to get from where I started out my career to doing architecture. Yeah, I, I love the point about listening. I mean, I think it's, I guess I would build on that by saying it's it's being emotionally intelligent enough to know when the role is to listen and know when the role is to lead and sort of be visionary and say, look, yes, we could go that way, but actually there's a more bold, ambitious, strategic direction over here that we could also take. But but, but you need to do the listening first. And I would point at my ears if they weren't covered by my headphones. Um, you need to do that listening and that analytical piece first so that, that that you've understood what the opportunities are rather than I see some people kind of just having a, a technology platform that they're just keen to get on their CV and so therefore they're just looking for every opportunity to say let's move to cloud or whatever or, 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 or generative AI or whatever it is now uh, and, and and talking too much and not listening to the to the business challenges enough before they they then try and kind of work out the roadmap um, but um, Wendy questions for, from you for Eric at all yeah yeah um i'll maybe just start with one so question eric is what advice would you give to enterprise architects and it architects around the business architecture and part of why i'm asking that is you're actually certified right in business architecture you have a holistic and contemporary view of, of business architecture i sort of feel like sometimes we give some lip service on yeah yeah just that business architecture stuff so just what would you share with our, our EA and IT architect colleagues? Interesting question, Wendy. Thanks. Thank you for that. The main takeaway, um, I think for me, when doing the certified business architecture training was gaining insight into knowing how to take an organization by the hand in determining the impact certain strategic choices have on their organization. So, and of course, also being able to express them using certain diagrams or matrices and, and whatnot. So you could actually visualize the impact change has on an organization. That was the main takeaway from the CBA training. And I think that is a very important thing to hand out to enterprise or IT architects. Tremendously insightful. I love that. I love that perspective through your eyes. Cool. And so, Eric, the the podcast is called Architect Tomorrow, right? So, the question I I ask almost every uh, person that comes on the podcast is what uh, is about the future. So, what um, what emerging technologies? And I guess you can cheat by saying AI, but but hopefully you won't. Um, or external trends? Do you think are going to shape? enterprise architecture in the in the coming years what what do you see coming down the tracks that you think enterprise architects really need to pay attention to so i thought of, of two things um i do want to to point out the ai part but not especially in in, in a good way now i will uh, provide an example for it but the other thing that i see happening is that business architecture will skyrocket in the next say decade because of its way it allows organizations like i just said to visualize the impact of the change they want to to realize and when enterprise architects or it architects who are perhaps enterprise architects realize the power of of the tooling they have in their hands or at their fingertips i think that will instantly grow um, the maturity of the profession so that's one thing that i predict for the next decade and then of course there is ai and we all talk about ai sometimes we talk too much about ai um, but i'm not all that convinced that ai will help enterprise architecture in the in the near future and 
what I mean by that, if you look at, for example, a situation where I work at a hospital, the hospital had a, a very firm desire to also incorporate AI in their daily practice, for example, to have doctors not um, do the consultations all by themselves, but have AI do the consultation for them based on the, the data that was gathered, gathered uh, throughout the, the uh, various hospitals in at least the Netherlands. But in practice, what you saw happening was that most of the, the, the elderly people, they didn't want to listen to uh, a, a chatbot telling them how they are feeling, what they should be doing in order to, to gain better health, etc. They wanted to actually talk to a, a doctor of flesh and blood. So perhaps that the next generations, and um, the ones that are like my, my and your, your children who are far more grown up with modern technology, that it will resonate far better than it does now with the, the elderly people. So to give an example of how that works, it, my youngest son, when he was four, so that's about 12, 12 to 13 years ago, he was very capable of, of using our, our telephone by swiping um, the various apps, etc. And once we introduced the television to him, he walked up to the screen and also started swiping on it. It's, so he's grown up with, with modern technology. And I think that that generation will e more easily accept data-driven technology in their daily life than the generation does now that, that goes to the actual hospital. So I think if you look at the, the Gardner hype cycle, um, we just we're at the peak or just below the peak of of AI, and I think now is is a phase that we will discover uh, what we can use from AI, what we can learn from it, and what we don't want to use. So in the next decade, it will kind of flatten out a bit. So that's my prediction for AI. Okay, that's sorry a... to use AI. But... No, 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 no. It's fine. I thought I, I thought it would be it would be in the mix and. I guess where, where that leads me is to wonder whether enterprise and business architects will actually play a pivotal role in helping organizations decide what capabilities are automated and what ones remain human, right? I mean, because there's lots of debate now. And I think one of the things I see coming fairly soon is um, us revaluing how much like, the, the, the human being has in our organizations, right? The, the fact that the, the, these things, the, these technologies are incredible but they're also, you know, they're not perfect and they're not for every situation. And so I think you're right. We're seeing this sort of hype of inflated expectations at the moment, aren't we? And let's just throw AI everything. And then I think what we'll perhaps land on is a more pragmatic middle ground where we go, do you know what? It makes sense to automate or augment or, or do diverse things here. But actually there's a whole set of capabilities over here where we don't actually want AI to be the experience that our customers have or our employees have. We actually want there to be a, you know, an, an in-person experience. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that that'll be interesting when we get to that level of maturity. I'm not, I'm not seeing that yet, but hopefully we'll get we'll get there reasonably soon. Um, so, Eric, this has been great. I guess the last thing I would I would I would ask you is if there's one thing that people take away from the book, the, the, the people that read it, what what uh, what would that what would that be? The one thing I stressed earlier that enterprise architecture is first and foremost a strategic business management tool and most certainly not a technical instrument. So that's one thing. And the second thing I'd like to have readers take away from the book is that you shouldn't aim too high from the, from the start. Okay. Start with a, with a solid foundation and build from there. So I think it's better to do a few things right than a lot of things halfway. Amazing. Well, this was a great conversation, as I suspected it, it, it would be. Um, so thanks very much, Eric. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, David. Um, the, this is one of a few now uh, author uh, conversations we've had. And do go and check out Wendy's rec recording that we did um, with Catherine and with Lisa as well. That was a great conversation about business architecture. So if you want to delve more into the business architecture topic, do go and check that one out. And of course, AI has been covered quite a bit on Architect Tomorrow as 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 well uh so yeah do go and check out the, the last episode actually was was uh, was uh, was on no sorry episode before last was on was on ai the episode uh, last episode was actually geospatial technologies so um how do we map out the real world using using tech 
So um, yeah, with that, hopefully you found this a, a, a good a good listen. Please do subscribe, share this with your colleagues and, and friends so we expand the community uh, and then we get new and uh, different perspectives and voices to joining and, uh, and contributing. And with that, thanks everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Oliver. <laughs> Sorry, yes, I did mean to do it. Maybe we should just do this. <laughs> I'll edit this in somehow. Yeah, and of course, do go and check out the book, folks. Uh, and Eric, you could have made that plug, but I've done that for you. I will on page. Uh, and there you go. It's available electronically as well for those who are on ebooks. So, uh, yes, great stuff. Thank you.